Hey, good, good morning. Hope everybody's uh, recovering from the Super Bowl. And I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Amgen and Janssen Pharmaceuticals. So we, we're really transitioning uh, now the way we have our general fellows do grand rounds at the request of the, the um, grand rounds committee. Uh, we'll have the senior fellows present on a topic of, of uh, their choosing senior year. So this is kind of an interim. We're gonna have our three senior fellows present cases this morning. So I think anybody that's worked with our fellows know that these three fellows, which is our eighth graduating class uh, since the formation of this fellowship are they're outstanding clinicians. And I think they've been very focused on developing the skills that they need to take good care of our patients. And just as a bragging point, our fellow, our fellows on their in-training exam are in the top 10% of the thousand or so fellows nationwide. So I think that's something to be proud of and thank you to everybody that participates. So just some uh, brief introductions of, of the three fellows. We have um, Jonathan Erbach, a native of Cape Cod. He did undergrad and med school at BU. He did, started his training at Beth Israel before moving here to Abbott for, uh, for family reasons. And Jonathan has a, a young uh, family, will be staying here in Minneapolis and joining our uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute as a general cardiologist. So we have Yulia Tulai, did I say it correctly? After <laughs> three years, a native of Romania, uh, where she did med school <clears throat> before moving to the Danbury Hospital in Connecticut, a Yale affiliate, where she was resident and chief resident. And in addition to the echo boards, actually, if I, if I didn't say, all three fellows are echo boarded, uh, which is a very competitive uh, test. Uh, Yulia is also nuclear boarded, and she will be finally moving closer to her husband and joining the Swedish Heart and Vascular Institute in Seattle when she finishes. And then finally, Jared Routh here is a native of Iowa, and he did his undergrad in med school at Creighton, uh, did his residency at University of Iowa, worked as a hospitalist before joining us, and he welcomed baby Luke uh, to the uh, fellowship family in uh, December and will be uh, moving back to Iowa, to the Iowa Heart Center in Des Moines when he finishes. So with that introduction, thanks for uh, doing this, Jared. And I've got this one. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Dr. Harris. Uh, thank you all. It's nice to see your smiling faces this morning. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and get started. So. The case I'm presenting is a 20-year-old young woman uh, with pre-excitation who was referred to a cardiology clinic. She initially was seen in the emergency department after uh, she smoked marijuana and suspected it was laced. They did an EKG, uh, which you see here, and she actually left the emergency department before any further evaluation uh, was performed. Uh, but you see uh, the EKG demonstrates uh, pre-excitation with the delta wave and, and uh, uh, marked T-wave inversions and increased voltage, especially across the precordial leads here. So in clinic, um, she complained only of rare palpitations. The rest of her um, uh, history was, was completely unremarkable. Uh, no syncope ever, no exertional symptoms ever. She denied any heart failure symptoms, uh, any other symptoms of, of um, lightheadedness or dizziness. Her past medical and surgical history were unremarkable. She's healthy otherwise on no medications, uh, she had no allergies. Pertinent family history for a paternal grandfather with a stroke, and uh, she uses uh, alcohol and marijuana socially, uh, in her words, and denies the use of, of other uh, illicit substances. Her EKG uh, in the clinic was very similar to the one performed in the emergency department, except a slower heart rate. She was um, hemodynamically stable with a heart rate of 85 and a normal blood pressure. Her cardiovascular exam uh, was unremarkable, as was the uh, rest of her physical exam. Uh, 
So we approach this uh, like a young woman presenting with, uh, with pre-excitation. And so we recommended a seven-day Z-O-Patch ambulatory cardiac monitor, uh, a treadmill stress test to, to evaluate for resolution of the, of the delta wave at a higher heart rate with exertion, and a transthoracic echocardiogram. <clears throat> As she waited for the other test, she completed the, the Z-O-Patch, which demonstrated uh, some non-sustained VT, the longest 17 beats and the fastest uh, 214 beats per minute. We see five beats of, of non-sustained VT here. This uh, tracing here was also called uh, ventricular tachycardia by the, by the monitor, but as you, excuse me, uh, but as you can see here, uh, it's, it's more irregular and, and in, in this tracing, it, it actually appears that the delta wave persists, but it's wider. So thinking that, um, that this is via the accessory pathway. And she also had 68 episodes of, of supraventricular tachycardia as well. She exercised on a treadmill. Uh, she demonstrated really pretty good exercise uh, capacity. She exercised for nine minutes, uh, achieving almost 11 mets, a peak heart rate of 173 beats per minute. She didn't have any exercise-induced arrhythmias. And her, uh, interestingly, her delta wave uh, did not resolve at an increased heart rate. And that's associated with a, a slightly higher risk uh, phenotype of, of WPW or pre-excitation. And so we referred her to electrophysiology uh, for consideration of EP study and, and accessory pathway ablation. In the meantime, um, she had her echocardiogram, which was markedly abnormal. It, uh, both of those are playing good. Uh, it, it demonstrated uh, marked uh, increased uh, left ventricular wall thickness um, in the septum, but also uniformly, also involving the posterior wall and, and, uh, and the right ventricle, as you'll see in a, in a later slide here. Um, the septum measured about 1.8 centimeters and the posterior wall about 1.7 centimeters. It was a bit, a bit thicker by MRI. Here's a, a short axis. Um, again, demonstrating the, the marked increased uh, LV wall thickness. And in the four chamber here, similar findings, but I'll point out the, uh, the right ventricular uh, involvement as well, and seen probably better here in the contrasted images uh, with the RV on the right, sort of in the male format. The uh, 3D, uh, or the EF by 3D, uh, this is a little small, but was calculated at, at 49%, so mildly reduced LV systolic function. And, and probably the most interesting thing on her echocardiogram was the uh, LV strain pattern. And this is longitudinal strain, and what we see here is a marked reduction in the strain in the, in the mid and, and basal segments. Uh, with sparing at the apex in a similar pattern that, that we actually commonly see in amyloidosis in, in older patients. But remember, uh, this is a 20-year-old young woman. So we'll come back to this, uh, of course. So she had um, underwent uh, cardiac MRI. This was performed at... at uh, I saw this patient at Hennepin County Medical Center, and so this MRI was performed there. Uh, these are the, the Cine images um, of the 4, 3, 2, and, and short axis. Um, we don't have T1 and T2 mapping on, on this MRI. Um, but, but again, you see um, marked LV wall, uh, increased wall thickness. Uh, I think in, in the 4 chamber, the 2 chamber, maybe um, with some asymmetry, the septum being uh, a bit thicker, um, and then we move on to the, uh, to the late gadolinium enhancement images, which, which demonstrated a, a really a kind of an interesting, interesting pattern of, of gadol late gadolinium enhancement and, and fibrosis. Um, let's see if we can get these to kind of walk through here. I'm not going to let me control it too much, but, um, but here again, I... I can't use my pointer, but uh, the kind of subendocardial involvement in the anterior wall, um, almost transmural involvement at the, at the apex and apical inferior wall. And in the short axis here, there are some islands of, of transmural late granulatum enhancement and fibrosis, uh, but, but largely subendocardial. We'll come back to some specific findings in the septum there. And here's the, the two-chamber, and, and uh, again, if I can get this to, uh, 
it's a little bit clunky here. But again, we, we see uh, late gadolinium enhancement here, the apex, um, some mid uh, septal involvement here, as well as, uh, as, well as the, the lateral wall here and uh, the right ventricle and, and the, uh, the atria as well. So we actually, you know, suspected that the, 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 the phenotype uh, in this patient is similar to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, but given the, the fact that she also had, had pre-excitation, there was some concern for uh, an, another mutation like PRKAG2 mutation, which often presents uh, with an HCM phenotype and, and uh, pre-excitation. And so we referred her uh, for in vitae genetic testing. And this is where things, I think, kind of got uh, a little bit more interesting. Uh, it was actually positive for uh, a mutation in LAMP2, which is lysosomal, a lysosome-associated membrane protein. And uh, this is a pathologic mutation uh, in X-linked Dannon disease. And that's, in fact, what, uh, what she was diagnosed with, uh, very interestingly. Uh, it's classified as a rare disease, which means less than 200,000 200, people have it. But it, the prevalence is, it's so rare, the prevalence is really unknown, but thought to be probably less than 50,000 people. And so I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about, about Dannon disease. It's something that I think maybe I, I recognized uh, the name Dannon disease uh, eight weeks ago, but I don't know that I could tell you more than one or two defining characteristics of the disease. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, but it was actually discovered and, and sort of named back in 1981 um, by Morris Dannon, who uh, came across two 16-year-old patients with skeletal muscle weakness, delayed speech, and cardiomyopathy. As I mentioned, phenotypically, it can be similar to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which caused by sarcomere protein gene mutations. But it's typically distinguishable from, from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in that uh, you have pre-excitation and other non-clinical features, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but it, it really is one of the, the more lethal cardiomyopathies, especially in, in young people. And because of its X-linked nature, survival in males past 25 without uh, transplant or LVAD is, is actually quite, quite rare. The data that I'll present is, is largely from case reports and, and case series. As I mentioned, LAMP2 mutation is the lysosomal associated membrane protein. And what that does is it's involved in autophagy and, and lysosomal protein degradation. And so that process, those processes don't happen normally when, when there's a, a knockout mutation uh, of sorts in, in LAMP2. And um, those byproducts build up and you have deposition uh, of intracytoplasmic vacuoles, especially in the, the cardiac and skeletal muscle. Its X-linked uh, dominant inheritance, inheritance pattern means that uh, males typically present earlier and with a more severe phenotype uh, than females and often progress to end-stage heart failure and death uh, more quickly than, than females do as well. Clinical manifestations. Um, this is from a case series out of the University of Colorado uh, two main centers study Dannon disease, uh, the University of Colorado and Eric Adler's group at the University of California, San Diego. But we see that, that men present predominantly with a hypertrophic pattern, whereas women present uh, almost equally with a hypertrophic and, and dilated cardi cardiomyopathy panel, uh, pattern. Uh, Wolf Parkinson White and pre-excitation is, is quite common. Uh, in, in this group of patients. And there's evidence of both extranodal accessory pathways, but then also fascicular ventricular pathways. Those pathways don't typically present in re tachycardia, but, um, um, but can be clinically meaningful in the setting of, of an ablation. This data uh, is from Eric Adler's group, Brambetti et al., and I'll just kind of highlight a few things here. Again, the incidence of, of dilated cardiomyopathy at presentation is much more common in females than in, than in males. Um, the, uh, on CMR, about um, 70 to 80 percent of these patients have evidence of late gadolinium enhancement. Um, ICDs are common in, in about a third of the patients in this series um, had an ICD, but as we'll talk later, they may be less effective actually in this population, which is kind of scary because these patients are typically quite young. Uh, in terms of the late gadolinium enhancement that we talked about in our patient and that we saw, one interesting thing, again, uh, out of Eric Adler's group in, in San Diego, 
is that um, they identify this pattern in 12 patients where uh, there is kind of sparing of the, of the mid-interventricular septum uh, without evidence of late gadolinium enhancement. And, and this might not be the best image, but I think when you look at, look at our, our patient's uh, LGE pattern, there is some sparing of, of the interventricular septum there as well. And then the strain imaging, like I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, this, is, this is known and recognized in several case series uh, that, um, that there's an apical sparing pattern. But the difference is that, that these patients are young. These are not our older, uh, more typical amyloid patients. And so it, it should you know, certainly raise concern that if you ever see a pattern like this in, in a young patient or a child that's, that's abnormal and might be associated with Dannon disease, what we don't know is if strain imaging in this pattern can be used to differentiate between other uh, genetic cardiomyopathies that present in young patients like Pompe's or Frederick ataxia and things like that. But there is some, some, some evidence that, um, that this strain imaging might be more predictive of, uh, of outcomes than EF. And then I'll present this paper. This is by uh, Dr. Barry Marin uh, during his time here at Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, actually uh, published in, in 2009. And this is a case series small case series, just seven patients, but they followed these patients for about nine years. And as we see these patients, uh, uh, six of them were male and they were young. This is a pediatric population in this case series. They all presented quite young. And I'll draw your attention here. Two of these patients had uh, uh, LV wall thickness greater than uh, 60 millimeters. It, and it's, it's quite remarkable. I'll show you a pathologic image here in a minute. Um, but it's important to note that, that these patients uh, were all NYHA class one at the time of their presentation and quickly progressed uh, to sudden death, acute heart failure death, uh, or progressive heart failure, one of which was transplanted. Uh, six of them had ICDs, but the ICDs failed to convert uh, ventricular fibrillation uh, to normal rhythm in five of the patients, actually. And so this is from Dr. These images are from Dr. Marin's study. Uh, patient, uh, Dan and disease hearts are actually uh, some of the heaviest hearts uh, on record. Uh, this heart was at the, at the time of, um, of, of, aut of autopsy was uh, over 1,400 grams uh, in weight, just remarkably heavy. And there's some case reports that, that the hearts have actually been, uh, surgeons have had difficulty actually physically removing them from the chest at the time of, of transplant because they're so big. And so I think it begs the question, is there any treatment for, for Dannon-specific uh, Dannon therapy? And until uh, a year or two ago, no. Uh, but Eric Adler's group out of the University of San Diego has a gene therapy trial that's, that's ongoing and enrolling now. And so potentially maybe for these patients, um, there, there could be um, specific therapy in the future. So take home points. Uh, Dannon disease is often mistaken uh, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy related to, uh, to, to sarcomeres, uh, but it's important to uh, recognize it, and, and if you don't know what it is and you're not looking for it, then you'll never diagnose it. Um, it requires some additional clinical suspicion, especially in young patients with significant LVH and WPW, and we should think about genetic testing mu much earlier in, in these patients, and, and probably all patients with the with non-ischemic cardiomyopathies uh, because, um, you know, more and more um, gene therapies and specific treatments uh, will probably be developed in coming years. And so if we're able to, to diagnose these patients with genetic testing, then hopefully we could get them um, potentially um, uh, therapeutic intervention earlier. So we'll hold questions at the end, but uh, thanks for your time, everyone. Uh, John, can I just have a normal screen here rather than two? Um, 
And while we'll, we'll do that, I would just say that was a great presentation. And gosh, I wish I went first so that I don't have to follow that <laughs> presentation. <laughs> um, sorry about the delay. Thank you. Should work. Oh, thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, really appreciate it, especially now that we're starting to transition to, back to in-person. Um, so as you can see on my um, title slide, uh, we'll talk about uh, mitral stenosis case. Probably one of your run-of-the-mill mitral stenosis cases, or maybe not, I guess we'll see together. Um, so this is the case of a 35-year-old female who uh, I actually saw in the cardioobstetric clinics. Um, she was referred to us for symptomatic rheumatic mitral disease, and yes, I did say symptomatic. Uh, she was diagnosed with this about five months uh, prior to her presentation. She had back then a stress echo, um, and on this stress echo, her mitral gradient increased from 8 to 28 millimeters of mercury. She was scheduled for a balloon valve elopplasty, but then this was canceled because she found out she was six weeks pregnant. So now she's presenting to the cardio B clinic with uh, more dyspnea on exertion. Uh, she was now short of breath around, uh, after around 100 feet of walking. She had intermittent palpitations. Some of them were irregular. Um, she had pretty borderline vital signs, as you can see here, and she was already on the metoprolol prescribed by her usual cardiologist. And by the way, she was on metoprolol uh, when she had the uh, stress echo as well. Um, so I know I told you that I saw this patient in the cardio B clinic, but I'm kind of curious if you were to think about it, what would you do if you saw this patient in your clinic? And I know that the majority of you will say, well, obviously, refer to Dr. Saxena because she's a super physician. Um, but the reason why I chose to talk about this case is, uh, well, multifold. One, I think out there in the real world, uh, outside of MHI, there's not enough Dr. Saxenas. There's not enough specialists that are um, seeing patients like this. And I think sooner or later, we'll all get to see this sort of patient in our general cardiology uh, clinic. So I thought it's a good opportunity to discuss about a few items in uh, the management of this sort of patient. And another reason uh, to choose this, uh, this case to discuss about is because I personally felt uh, when I heard about this patient that I was kind of sitting on a ticking time bomb. And why am I using the ticking time bomb analogy, uh, analogy? Well, to understand this, we need to understand a bit more about the hemodynamics of pregnancy and then to see how uh, mitral stenosis plays a role in someone uh, who becomes pregnant. So there's a couple of changes that I would briefly like to talk about in uh, pregnancy, hemodynamic changes. One is the increase in blood volume. There's increase in both plasma um, volume as well as red blood cell uh, mass. We can see them here depicted in green and this sort of grayish color. They both start increasing ver very early on in pregnancy and the plasma uh, volume kind of peaks somewhere in the mid uh, second trimester. Um, and the overall increase is somewhere about 50% compared to baseline. Obviously, if you have increased blood volume, there's going to be increased cardiac output, um, but there's also going to be increased heart rate uh, because of this uh, decrease in the systemic vascular resistance. So by increasing stroke volume, incre increasing cardiac, uh, inc increasing heart rate, uh, there's going to be an increase in cardiac output, which you see here depicted in blue. This starts right at the beginning of pregnancy, and again, it peaks somewhere in the mid-second uh, trimester. These vertical lines divide the trimesters, um, as you hopefully noticed. So if you see this increase in cardiac output, I hope you can already anticipate what would happen in someone with mitral stenosis, um, and you will have increased gradients across the mitral valve and develop uh, symptoms either early on or probably no later than mid-second trimester. Uh, there's also going to be an, a decrease, I'm sorry about this, uh, in blood pressure and uh, systemic vascular resistance. Both the diastolic and the systolic blood pressure actually change. It's more the diastolic than the systolic. For some reason here, they depicted in pink the systolic blood pressure, uh, but the same thing happens with diastolic. Right at the beginning of pregnancy, they, begin, uh, they uh, continue to decrease, and the, uh, the lowest value is somewhere in the middle of the second trimester, and then it goes uh, slightly up, probably even to higher values than the patient started with before pregnancy. 
Then during labor and delivery, I'm sorry for the non-medical term, but just imagine that everything is in overdrive, as you can see these uh, peaks here. Um, the cardiac output can increase as high as 75%, and the reason is, well, simply put, twofold. One, because of the increased stroke volume, uh, and this happens because of a very interesting phenomenon that is called autotransfusion. What this means is that during each uterine contraction, there's blood that is actually displaced from the uterine um, circulation to the mother circulation. So this is the autotransfusion, which will increase the stroke volume and obviously increase the cardiac output. And as you can imagine, during delivery, there's going to be pain, there's going to be a sympathetic surge, so the heart rate will increase as well, so the cardiac output will increase even further. So you can imagine how difficult it might be to uh, have someone uh, who is pregnant and with a pre-existent cardiovascular disease that maybe doesn't tolerate a high cardiac output. And then in postpartum period, I will just say it's a rapid volume shift. It's pretty difficult to treat these patients because there are several things happening and you don't really know exactly in which state you're at. Um, based, what I mean by this is there is blood volume loss um, because of the delivery per se. Uh, then you'll have a temporary increase in venous return because of the autotransfusion that I just mentioned and also because you have the relief of the inferior vena cava. So basically, that um, pregnant uterus is uh, compressing on the inferior vena cava for almost the entire duration of the pregnancy, and then all of a sudden, you have the compression relieved uh, when the baby is born, and then you'll have more venous return to the heart and more increased stroke volume, uh, increased cardiac output with increased renal blood flow, with breast diuresis. So you can imagine that, there's a, an, uh, that there is a lot of rapid volume shift during this time. And obviously the hypercoagulability of pregnancy, which you all know about. So now that we understood a bit of the hemodynamics of pregnancy, granted oversimplified, um, I hope you can understand why in patients with mitral stenosis, with the increased cardiac output, we'll have increased val valve gradients as the cardiac output goes up, and you can start having symptoms uh, like heart failure, arrhythmias, and everything else associated with mitral stenosis. Mild mitral stenosis is usually well tolerated, and with more severe mitral stenosis, you can expect, uh, unfortunately, complications, even mortality up to 3% in the developed countries, and even uh, higher than this in the less developed countries. How can we help such patients? Well, um, three things that I will go over, but the most important is prevention. And I know I put a equal sign there, pre uh, prevention uh, as preconception planning, and I know a lot of us are thinking, oh, I'm a general cardiologist, I'm not going to do that. But if there's only one thing that you are uh, left with after this talk, I hope it's going to be exactly this. We will need to do preconception planning, and uh, it's basically going to probably be called different, but we will need to all do preconception planning every time a patient comes with a cardiovascular condition to your general cardiology clinic. If they are at the childbearing age, uh, just talk to her about what would happen if she were to become pregnant. Most of the patients will not ask you about this. They will ask you about, hey, how do I treat my mitral uh, valve disease? How do I treat this? But just please have in your, uh, in your mind that it's easy to re these patients and briefly talk to them about this. I know I put here three different restratification tools. Uh, they are CARPREG2, they are Zahara, they are the MHU classification. But actually, the most recent guidelines looking at cardiopregnancy and uh, cardiovascular disease um, makes it, make it very, very easy for us. They are recommending, class one recommendation, to use this MHU classification. And it's um, very easy to pull up. A quick internet search will give you this um, five category uh, risk uh, tool. And you just have to look up the condition that your patient is coming to see you for and just see where that condition falls into this MHU classification. If, for example, uh, this patient, if you see that she has, or if you suspect that she has severe mitral stenosis, you will actually see that she falls into category four where pregnancy is contraindicated. And again, most of the patients will not ask you what would happen if they become pregnant, but it's, uh, it's good for us to know because we might need to talk about um, preventing the pregnancy as well. And by the way, you can see here on the uh, right side, uh, the column on the right side, that 
this MHO classification not only tells you whether pregnancy is contraindicated or not, but it also predicts a risk of cardiovascular complications during pregnancy. And you can see for the um, MHO class four, it's between uh, 40 and 100%. But our patient was already pregnant, so obviously our attention needed to shift to medical treatment and optimization. I will not tell you anything you don't know. It's a patient with mitral stenosis. We need to decrease the uh, gradient across the valve, um, mostly with beta blockers. In her, unfortunately, we couldn't do that because her blood pressure was already borderline. If you're wondering uh, about evagrodine, I will just say quickly it's uh, not approved in pregnancy because on... Um, Animal studies, it turns out that it has a lot of fetal toxicity, teratogenic um, uh, effects, so basically it's not really appro approved. And if you have a patient on Evabradin for different reasons, if she's at a childbearing uh, age, you actually need to recommend contraception. We also need to make sure that we are preventing uh, heart failure symptoms in these patients and maintaining them euvolemic. And the best trick for this is to check serial BNPs. Uh, why? Because it will help you differentiate pregnancy symptoms versus heart failure symptoms. Both pregnant patients and heart failure patients will complain of shortness of breath. Both, both uh, pregnant patients and heart failure patients will complain of uh, lower extremity edema. And it's hard to differentiate the symptoms between the two. But with BNPs, they actually should remain normal throughout pregnancy. Yes, maybe they will increase a bit, but overall they should remain normal. So if your pe pregnant patient uh, complains of shortness of breath, check a BNP. If it's normal, you probably don't want to diurese that patient. Then obviously we need to identify tachyarrhythmias. If there's AFib, uh, we know already. We need to anticoagulate these patients regardless of the chest vas score because of the rheumatic mitral stenosis. We might even need to consider maintaining sinus rhythm if we want to maintain cardiac output. But nothing will magically pop up that, uh, pop that valve open, so obviously we need to discuss about uh, valve intervention, especially in this patient who was already symptomatic even before becoming pregnant. The only question uh, is when. So if we look again at the diagram with the hemodynamic changes, you can probably imagine that if you intervene on the valve, uh, the, the sooner it's going to be better because the cardiac output will not have the chance to increase as much you, and uh, there's going to be a, a less of a risk for your patient to be an extremist. But you can also imagine that the sooner you intervene, and especially if you're considering balloon valvuloplasty with radiation, the earlier you intervene, the, the, uh, the higher the uh, risk of uh, um, harming the fetus with radiation. So it seems that the organogenesis is actually completed somewhere around 10 weeks of gestational age. Uh, and it seems that if you have to do a procedure with radiation on patient, uh, pregnant patients, the best time would be at least 12 weeks after the last menstrual period and actually somewhere around the uh, fourth month of the second trimester because that's when your organogenesis is complete. That's when the fetal thyroid is not yet active. And that's when the patient still has a pretty small uterine volume that it doesn't really, um, uh, it, it's not as enlarged for the baby to actually be in the radiation beam direction. Um, we should try to keep a radiation dose below 10 to 20 centigrades, and this is because this seems to be the threshold above which the uh, fetus can still have complications. Uh, and this is just an example of some medical procedures and the fetal exposure um, uh, uh, to radiation. So our patient did end up having a balloon valvuloplasty. This was done when she was 19 uh, weeks pregnant. Um, she had guidance both fluoroscopic, uh, I mean, with all fluoroscopic uh, transthoracic echo intracardiac guidance to minimize the dose of radiation. Uh, with this, she got 491 milligrays, but this was the dose that the mother got. The fetus, hard to say how much they got. There is a formula that you can <clears throat> use to kind of estimate how much radiation uh, goes to the fetus if the fetus is in direct, uh, uh, exposed directly to the radiation beam. You multiply by 0 0.15 uh, times the radiation that the mom got, but this is an oversimplified formula. And in our patient and in her fetus, it was actually even less because the fetus was not uh, in uh, direct uh, direction of the, of the beam and of the radiation. 
So she had to three total balloon inflations. Her gra gradient went from previous eight to now five. They avoided further dilations to avoid significant MR. Now the patient was actually just seen by her usual cardiologist last week, and apparently she was doing pretty well. She had an echo last week with a mitral valve area uh, approximated somewhere around 1.8 centimeters squared. Um, her symptoms were manageable, and obviously the emphasis during this uh, visit was the fact that she will need uh, uh, some sort of surgical intervention of the, uh, uh, on the valve because the point of the <coughs> balloon valvuloplasty is just to get her through the pregnancy, and as you all know, it's not a, um, a long-term solution. Take-home messages from uh, this talk is if you can remember the hemodynamics of pregnancy, um, then remember to use the MHO classification for uh, women of childbearing age when they come to see you in the cardiology clinic, regardless of what they see you for. Um, it might be a good discussion to have with your patients. If a condition is in the MHO class four, recommend against immediate pregnancy, and you might even want to recommend contraception, or at least the patient discussing contraception with her primary care physician. Um, and if you have to do an intervention with ionizing radiation on these patients, the safest window is at least 12 weeks after the last menstrual period, but probably somewhere around the fourth month of the second trimester, and try to keep the radiation dose to the fetus lower than 10 to 20 centigrade. And these are just some possible resources if anyone is interested in reading more about this topic, and that's all I have. Thank you. Well, in honor of Valentine's Day, I have a uh, case to share with everyone. No disclosures. So this is a 47-year-old man with no significant past medical history. In July of 2020, he developed worsening cough and fever, and he was hospitalized with uh, multifocal pneumonia. He was treated for community-acquired pneumonia and, and improved during his three-day hospital course, and then continued to improve at home, but then uh, shortly thereafter started having intermittent pleuritic chest pain as well as shooting pains in his left leg. Started behind his left knee and then shot down to his ankle and foot. The next month he came in with those symptoms. Um, he had leg ultrasounds that were normal. Chest x-ray looked uh, to be pretty stable. Um, EKG was not ischemic. He had a CT that was negative for PE, but did show that his right upper lobe consolidation had evolution of a central cavitation, which raised concern for possible necrotizing pneumonia or granulomatous infection. During his workup, he also had a troponin that was elevated at 5.7 and cardiology was consulted. So he went for coronary evaluation with the coronary CTA. I'll let this play through, but uh, the calcium score was negative and there was no evidence of any underlying coronary atherosclerosis or severe stenosis that it could account for his symptoms. So at this point, the cardiology impression was that this was most likely a case of acute myopericarditis in the setting of multifocal pneumonia versus a possible pulmonary vasculitis. <clears throat> ID and pulmonology were both following, and a rheumatologic panel was pending. HIV and COVID were negative. Uh, there was a plan for a bronchoscopy, but that wasn't completed yet. He had an echo that showed an EF of 55%, but a abnormal uh, wall motion abnormality in the mid anterior septum and septum. So he was sent for a cardiac MRI. So in this four-chamber view, that regional wall motion abnormality is clearly shown in the mid anterior septum and septum. And then on this representative slice, um, there are two distinct myocardial infarctions, one in the region of the wall motion abnormality and another in the basal infralateral wall. So based on this, there are two infarctions with evidence of microvascular obstruction and edema in two different coronary distributions. And the thinking was that this was either multivessel embolism or possible coronary vasculitis. 
And uh, the recommendation was made that you could think about getting an invasive angiogram, but only if needed for diagnostic purposes, if the pulmonary workup was unrevealing. There was also evidence for plain pericardium on uh, the cardiac MRI, which was consistent with acute pericarditis, and he was on colchicine for that. His laboratory workup at this point showed normal renal function, except for a little bit of microscopic hematuria. His inflammatory markers were elevated. And his c -inca was quite positive with a high titer, and it was directed against the antiprotonase 3 antibodies. So at this point, he was diagnosed with an anca associated vasculitis, uh, specifically granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or Wegener's. Um, his presentation included uh, pulmonary involvement, uh, neuropathy, which explained his left leg shooting pains, as well as coronary involvement. And it was supported by the positive c -inca, uh, with uh, antiprotonase 3 antibodies. He was referred for lung biopsy for confirmation. Uh, that didn't show granulomas, but rheumatology still thought that GPA was the most likely diagnosis, and he was started on prednisone. Shortly thereafter, um, he had acute onset of retrosternal chest pressure, which was not pleuritic and distinctly his than his initial presenting symptoms. ZKG is shown here and shows uh, ST depressions in the precordial leads that were not present on his prior. He was sent for angiogram, which I'll let play here. Um, there is a occlusion in uh, a high first stop tooth marginal and LED diagonal, which correspond with the areas of infarct on his MRI, as well as a, a new occlusion in this ramus, uh, which was thought to be the culprit vessel. Um, in that large second obtuse marginal, um, there are some distal changes that show kind of a ratty appearance of the vessel um, that uh, were thought to be consistent with vasculitis. <clears throat> so at this point, the patient was stable and asymptomatic, and there was question whether there would be benefit of revascularizing in the setting of active vasculitis. Um, so the decision was made to medically manage the infarct of the ramus. Um, and he was continued on high-dose prednisone and started on IV rituximab. And he had complete resolution of his symptoms uh, and has followed with outpatient rheumatology and cardiology. His neuropathy uh, persists, but is getting better. And as of March of last year, his ink actually turned from positive to negative, which has good prognostic value. So switching gears just to talk about um, coronary artery involvement in the setting of systemic vasculitis. Um, so any cardiac involvement in systemic uh, vasculitis is rare and is quite variable. So myocarditis, pericarditis, valvular disease are all more common than coronary artery involvement per se. Um, and coronary artery involvement is most commonly described in uh, polyarteritis nodosa, Kawasaki, Stagasu, arteritis. It's rarely um, involved in the ink associated vasculitis, uh, vascular disease. Uh, but in general, the teaching point is that when you have unexplained ACS in young patients without typical cardiac risk factors, in particular when there's uh, suspicion for vasculitis, there should be a high index of suspicion for coronary artery vasculitis. And in the setting of Inca-associated vascular disease, uh, they actually have an increased risk of coronary-related death um, compared to controls, um, which is thought to be secondary to either accelerated coronary atherosclerosis or active inflammation, but probably some combination of the two. Uh, and this was the teaser from the uh, title slide, the cardiac inflammation. So it's specifically um, uh, looking at GPA, so it classically this presents with respiratory involvement and kidney involvement, and cardiac involvement is quite rare. Um, the European Vasculitis Study Group, um, which uh, aggregates newly diagnosed ink associated vasculitis, um, showed that five to six percent of patients who have a new diagnosis have cardiac involvement of any type, and remember that coronary artery involvement is the rarest of any. Um, but uh, any cardiac involvement is actually an independent risk factor for relapse of the vasculitis. Um, but unfortunately, there was uh, no difference in any of the diet demographics or other clinical features that can help differentiate who's at risk for developing uh, cardiac involvement in GPA. Multimodality imaging played an important role in the diagnosis of this case, um, uh, but there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Um, so invasive angiography tends to have the best test characteristics for identifying coronary artery vasculitis, um, but it uh, it's, has limited ability to, dif to differentiate between some of the various diagnoses, but we'll touch on that. 
uh, specifically IVIS um, is considered to be the gold standard for assessing arterial wall integrity. Um, uh, and then thinking about CT and MRI, those are helpful in the direct assessment of the coronaries, but also in the evaluation of other vascular beds. And in particular with MRI, you can also look for myocardial and pericardial involvement, as we saw in this case. PET also has a role in looking at uh, hypermetabolism of the aorta in its first order branches, but the sensitivity falls off in the medium and small vessels, uh, including in the coronaries. And then perfusion studies have a role as well um, in helping determine viability of myocardium, but uh, of course can't differentiate what's um, vasculated from atherosclerotic. So touching on revascularization, this is um, an area that doesn't have uh, the most robust data, um, but observational data does show that surgery should be avoided in the setting of active inflammation. Um, and regardless of which revascularization strategy uh, is pursued, management of the underlying vasculitis is uh, of paramount importance. Um, in this one meta-analysis um, shown below, uh, this looked at patients with Takayasu's and compared endovascular and surgical repair um, across various uh, uh, um, vascular beds, but the subgroup that had coronary uh, involvement who went uh, underwent PCI or bypass showed that patients who had uh, PCI had higher rates of restenosis with a uh, hazard or odds ratio of 7.4. This summary table looks at um, some of the more common systemic vasculitis that have coronary artery involvement. And I'll draw your attention to this column here, um, where uh, there are some suggestive uh, CAS features that can help differentiate between some of the diagnoses. Um, with Takayasu's, the uh, appearance is that there's often ostular proximal narrowing of the vessel. Uh, and with polyarteritis nodosa, there's more of a beaded appearance of the vessels. And we'll look at some examples of those. So on this series, this is a patient with Takayasu's. Um, in panel A, uh, there's clearly uh, left main uh, osteal narrowing, which actually looks to be completely occluded uh, on cath with left to right collaterals. And similarly, there's osteal narrowing of the uh, RCA seen on CT as well as on invasive angiogram. And then uh, this is another nod to the uh, multimodality approach. Uh, in panel A and B, those are uh, MRI images showing edema and infarct in uh, the LAD distribution. Um, and then uh, multiple aneurysms um, in the LAD and diagonal. And then on these 3D reformatted uh, images, um, aneurysms again shown in the LAD and uh, in the REMA here. That's, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Great presentations, guys. Way, uh, way more than I in anticipated we were, we were going to get today. So, Jared, what, uh, what, how are you managing your patient? What, what are the next steps? So she was she was just diagnosed within the last eight weeks or so, uh, and and so actually, uh, as soon as I finished the presentation, uh, Dr. Renowitz was texting me uh, about her. <laughs> And it, it sounds like we transplanted a Dannon patient here about 15 years ago, she said. Um, but um, uh, we'll refer her, unfortunately, due to insurance constraints. She were, she's not able to, to be referred here to Minneapolis Heart Institute, um, but she'll be referred uh, to a, a robust heart failure and transplant center and, and, um, and hopefully um, you know, get some of the care she needs. Uh, there's some um, you know, financial considerations, but... Uh, you know, it would be great to connect her virtually with, with one of these larger centers studying Dannon disease um, as, as well. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. She's uh, slated to have an EP study uh, to consider uh, accessory pathway ablation and, and ICD as well. Other, question, other questions, Dr. Lesser? Julia, uh, in your patient specifically uh, balloon valvuloplasty potentially could be a long lasting not a forever solution in her what were what was her score wilton score do you remember 
And was she somebody who was a good candidate for? I think it was around seven before uh, the procedure, but they weren't extremely satisfied with the result uh, that they had after the procedure. The gradient only went as low as five, and that was uh, at the heart rate of around 70, 75. And they predicted that, at, especially in her, it will not be a long-lasting procedure, so eventually she will need some intervention. You're right, with some of them, uh, we are more lucky and they will last for a longer time. And her was apparently enough just to get her through pregnancy, but we'll need to think about something else pretty soon. There's no questions uh, virtually, but there's several uh, comments that just say excellent and fascinating presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.